In today's lecture, I'm going to teach you guys about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and about molecular orbitals. I've got to tell you, I love my job because part of my job is trying to help people to understand the ununderstandable. <sighs> now that I think about it, I think the word ununderstandable might be a double negative. Shouldn't it just be understandable? Well, whatever the case, let's begin by once again talking about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I'm going to take this quote directly from our book because I really like it. It says, the discovery of the wave properties of matter, which we talked about in our previous lecture, raised some new and interesting questions. Consider, for example, a ball rolling down a ramp. Using the equations of classical physics, we can calculate with great accuracy the ball's position, direction of motion, and speed at any instant. Can we do the same for an electron which exhibits much more significant wave properties? A wave extends in space and its location is not precisely definable. As we consider this question, whether or not we can actually define an electron's position and velocity in space, it brings us to this man right here, a German physicist whose name was Werner Heisenberg. He proposed that because subatomic, or really, really tiny particles have both wave-like and particle-like natures, it's impossible to precisely calculate both their locations and their momentums or velocities. This is called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. So once again, the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle says basically that you cannot, with a subatomic particle, know both its location and its momentum with perfect certainty. The more accurate your calculations of one of those two things get, the less accurate the other gets, and vice versa. So why am I teaching this to you? The reason, honestly, is because I wanted you, my students, to be able to understand the following joke, which I've lifted from quickmeme.com. Picture of Boromir from Lord of the Rings. One does not simply simultaneously determine both the position and momentum of an electron. Ha <laughs> ha. Now back to business. So. Because we can't know with absolute accuracy both an electron's position and its velocity or speed, we can't precisely know where it is around the nucleus and how fast it's going. However, we can calculate its probable location around the nucleus. This is done using a humongous equation called the Schrodinger equation. Don't worry, I won't make you learn it. Nevertheless, if we solve the Schrodinger equation for electrons at different energy levels, or quanta, it tells us where electrons are most likely to be located around the nucleus. For example, if we solve the Schrodinger equation for an electron at energy level 1, or n equals 1, we get a three-dimensional sphere that looks like this. And you might imagine doing that on a 3D graphing calculator. That sphere, which is once again the location around the nucleus, if you can imagine the nucleus being right at the center of where these three axes cross each other. That sphere around it represents all of the probable locations in which an electron will be found. That sphere happens to be called an s orbital. Once again, it represents the spherical location of space around the atom's nucleus in which an electron at energy level 1, or n equals 1, would most likely be found. So as it turns out, there are four different kinds of orbitals, s, p, d, and f. And I'm not the person who selected those letters. I'm just the messenger. We'll talk about these in greater detail later on. But just so you can see them, in the next three slides, I'll show you pictures of various s, p, and d orbitals. I'm not going to show you any f orbitals because they're super crazy looking, but you're welcome to look them up on the internet. I'll begin by showing you s orbitals. As it turns out, if you solve the Schrodinger equation for an s orbital at any energy level, n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., you'll notice that the shapes are like this. All of them have spherical shapes. The only difference from one s orbital to another is that the size gets larger and larger and larger. Thus, if you have an element that has electrons occupying a 3s orbital, that 3s orbital, like a Russian nesting doll, will have buried inside it a lower 2s orbital, and then buried inside that a 1s orbital with respective electrons found in each one of those. If you were to solve the Schrodinger equation for a p orbital, it would look like this. If the nucleus occupies this point in which three axes, an x, a y, and a z, straddle each other, then the p orbitals uh, occupy a region of space both above and below the axis. p orbitals, in effect, look like little dumbbells. 
And although they're drawn out separately, in reality, each of these p orbitals actually straddle this uh, central location, which is where the nucleus is found. One of those p orbitals straddles the x-axis, one straddles the y-axis, and one straddles the z-axis, with each one being perpendicular to each other, with 90 degree angles separating them. Like all orbitals, the p orbitals are locations of space in which certain electrons can be found around the nucleus. The only difference between p orbitals at a 2 energy level, or a 3 energy level, or a 4 energy level, or so forth and so on, is their size. They just get larger and larger and larger. Once again, just like Russian nesting dolls, these guys will all be found straddling these axes with larger orbitals kind of on top and around them as the energy levels increase. I hasten to point out that there are locations right here in the center of all of the p orbitals called nodes. Those happen to be locations at which the um, electrons mathematically cannot be found. In other words, an electron that might in one moment be zooming around this lobe up here, and then later in a, the lobe down here at the bottom, can never ever be found in this nodal space, this space right here called a node. So that begs the question, how in the world then does an electron go from this upper space down to this lower space without ever being at the space in between? The answer to that question is bleh. No, seriously, the answer actually is uh, because electrons are so tiny, tiny subatomic particles, their wave-like properties, which I sometimes just call their weird properties, are much more significant, which means that in theory, electrons can sort of teleport from one to the other or something like that, Star Trek sci-fi-like, without ever traversing this nodal space. This is a picture of all the various d orbitals. Each of them has different shapes. My favorite one happens to be the dz squared one. It kind of looks like a p orbital with a donut around them. One of my old professors, Dr. Hubbard, once told me that orbitals really are just like regions of space, empty parking spaces that electrons can occupy. That takes us then to the conclusion of this lecture set. Please stay tuned for our next one in which I will talk more deeply about the atomic nature of elements. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.